Nice to meet you all. My name is Britt Barak. Uh, I work at Nexmo uh, at the Developer Experience and Relations team, and I'm a part of Google Developer Experts program for Android. Um, I'm currently based in Israel, in Tel Aviv, and I came here uh, two or three weeks ago, something like that, for to work from our office, but also for a bunch of events. This, of course, uh, Jared Kanesef, which is uh, the highlight for me. Uh, and also two weeks ago, we had Android Dev Summit. Did anyone attend? Yeah? Awesome. So it was a really cool event. Uh, and it took place at the Computer History Museum. Um, have you been there? Has anyone visited? OK, cool. So it's a very, very cool place. Uh, among other reasons that I like it so much is because you can actually go to a respected uh, history exhibition and see some stuff that we had as kids that we grew up with, right? Or our siblings grew up with, like Pac-Man and Super Mario. And like, when did that become history? Um, we grew up with it. Um, so I think it's really, really cool. And it kind of uh, illustrates how technology moves so, so quickly. And the fact that we are actually a part of making it and creating it and experience it in the make, right? And if we think about the portion of technology which is closer to our world, which is uh, mobile and phone and uh, communication, basically, not long ago, do you remember the times when phones were just phones, like simply phones that you had in your home? Like I remember when I was a kid, so it was like going to the fridge. If you were hungry, we would go walk to the fridge, open the fridge, take some food, eat the food. That's it, it's over. So the same way you would go to the phone, pick up the phone, make the conversation, and that's it, it would be over. This is why this device was there for, right? Um, and that was really not long ago, actually. And then time passed, and at some point in time, phones became mobile, right? Do you know when was uh, the first mobile phone created? Do you have any idea? You can guess, come on. 95, so actually the first, so the first um, ever mobile uh, phone call was uh, at 1973. Yeah, it was um, by a guy called Martin Cooper. Uh, uh, we was working uh, for uh, Motorola, and he was calling um, the, the team at AT&T to say, hey, we made it, we made it before you, we had the first mobile phone call. So this was that in 1973. Uh, this is how this phone uh, looks like. Basically, it's quite big, I know, it's quite big. Uh, you had to charge it for 10 hours in order to get 30 minutes of talking time. So it's quite a lot. And only 10 years later, it was available to purchase commercially. Um, by this prototype, so it looked basically pretty much the same, a little bit lighter. And um, we now think maybe the Pixel, the new Pixel is uh, expensive, but this phone costs something like 4,000 uh, uh, US dollars, which is if we think how much its value for today is like almost 10,000 uh, US dollars for this phone for 30 minutes of conversation. So it's interesting, our situation now is better, right? Um, and ever since then, the, the devices and the technology advanced, of course, we kind of think of 90, uh, 1990 until 95, where a phone became, mobile phone became something that is a standard thing in, for each of us, for the average person to purchase and to use. Um, my favorite, of course, was the best app ever, which was in 1997, do you have an idea? Yes, it was the best one. So this was in 1997. Um, and yeah, the phones since then became um, better and uh, allowed us to do more and more and more things. And 
As I said, ever since then, communication basically became something that we could put in our pocket. It was the standard thing to do, to walk with it every day to every room, uh, and it became the standard and the normal thing to be connected and to be reachable every time, every day, always. All right. And then at some point in 1922, uh, the first text message was invented. So communication now became richer, right? We could do some more stuff, a part of the conversation. And then in uh, 2004, we could have sent photos. MMS, we could have sent those as well to other people. So communication became even more uh, uh, rich. And then uh, in 2007, um, the iPhone uh, was announced. And there were smartphones, I guess you can say, before that. But ever since then, it kind of changed some things and some standards uh, about the interfaces, about the design, about what we have, what can our devices, our mobile devices do for us, right? Because since then, we started to think about the phone a little bit differently, that it doesn't just make the normal communication between a person, one person to the other, but it also have these apps in our phone as a standard thing to do. So it means that now this phone that just used to do communication and that's it for us now has all these functionalities that most of them are very essential to our day to day, right? Navigation and payments and shopping and alarm clock and camera. So all these things became in one device. And therefore, this device had such a significant part um, in our everyday life. And we can say that from that moment on, the communication, if we thought about it, just as com communicated with one person to another, at, basically, it's, uh, it uh, had the distances shorter between people, but the communication types were kind of the same. We would always make conversation between people, and we can write letters or notes and send pictures. So this kind of stuff, we already know, and it made sense for us as communication. But from that moment on, we could have communicated with services or products uh, or like functionality, but basically it's services. And the apps, the applications where the interface was a, were a different interface to communicate with these uh, entities, right? So since we had all this very day-to-day -day functionality in our phone, it became a part of our identity, right? A part of our day-to-day, -day, a part of who we are and what we need to our day-to-day. -day. And if, we, if you think about it, literally, how many times did you have to prove and to verify your identity as a human being, as a person, in verifying your phone number, in verifying, verifying that you can actually physically be reachable with this type of um, communication uh, identity? How many times did it happen? So many. So now we know that with the apps, we actually make people, and we have this power and the responsibility to make people feel connected to one another, but also to the product, and also to the companies, to the services, to the world itself. Uh, and we are a part of shaping it, right? Because this is what we do. We create the apps and the SDKs. Um, so this is what we have uh, the privilege to do. And two small emphasis on this uh, sentence or, or the fact that we make, make people feel connected. So the first thing is that we should make all people feel connected. And this is kind of a realization that I feel that is, um, we feel that more and more in the recent years. Um, I just had the privilege last month uh, to speak at Droidcon uh, UK. And I told my personal story about how did I got to feel this um, obligation, I guess, to, uh, to make apps that are inclusive and make everyone feel connected. So I told the story of my grandmother uh, that uh, her vision is starting to be impaired. And at that moment, it suddenly occurred to me how easy it is 
for us to make other people feel disconnected from the world and to make them feel excluded. But luckily for us, it's just as easy to make everyone feel included by making the apps more accessible. So we can make people, um, more people, people that we love feel more connected every day. Now the second thing I do want to know is, to note here is the fact that we make people feel. So it's not anymore just about functionality, it's not just objective stuff, it's about feelings. And feelings are really, really important, right? Think about the days that uh, you had this wonderful day and you were so happy and everything worked out and you were extremely productive and everything was fun and was falling into place and actually the people that next to you actually observed this uh, great feelings from you and everything worked out for them as well. And the same thing with negative feelings. So feelings are very, very, very important. Um, and we actually have this power of uh, affecting them. And it's a great power that we have and we have to remember. There's a very interesting study that uh, actually they took many, many, many apps from all kinds of categories and try to figure out which ones uh, makes us feel different feelings. And there is a very um, uh, distinct uh, separation between the apps that actually makes us feel positive feelings and the apps that makes us feel negative feelings. An interesting thing about this study was that for the apps that makes us feel positive feelings, we spend something like nine minutes a day at each one of them. And can you guess how many uh, minutes do we spend for the ones who we feel negative feelings about? <laughs> so something like 27 minutes a day at each app that makes us feel not well. Um, so that's interesting, and we'll go back to that in a little bit. One of these uh, negative feelings uh, that we have, we fondly gave the name of FOMO, which is the fear of missing out. And we use these apps all the time, and we use the phones many, many, many times, um, just to not feel like we're missing something. For this one percent, this small chance that we might be missing something that is extremely important, uh, we keep being connected and we keep using the phone and the app even though it doesn't make us feel so good. And boy, we use that a lot, maybe too much. So just so you know, the average um, adult person uses phones every day, their phone, uh, something like two hours and 51 minutes a day you spend on your phone, and we unlock the phone 150 times a day on average. That's a lot. And as we said, most of the time we don't feel positive feelings about this stuff, so there, it can't be just you know, rational behavior, right? There so, has to be something more that makes us do that, actually, right? Um, so a very interesting person called uh, Tristan Harris, Tristan Harris, uh, used to be a design ethicist at Google and, and now is, uh, is the founder and leading the organization Time Well Spent. Uh, he is one of the people who talk a lot about that, about that domain, and also I think the first person who uh, talked about the idea that there are many things that uh, are similar to apps design and slot machines. So slot machines are um, one of the most uh, uh, profitable thing in the United States. They say that uh, the profit each year that it, uh, uh, it, it uh, produces is more than uh, the profit from movies and theme parks and baseball games combined. So that's a lot. Um, so it means that if we look at profit, they do something well. And he was talking a lot about why, uh, like the, the, shared, uh, the shared things between the designs of 
slot machines and, and phones and, and applications. I will mention uh, just a few. So the first thing is uh, the stimulation. The colors that we see that it's so colorful and the colors change all the time and the high pitch sounds like the ding, ding, ding and all this stuff that happen all the time and if, um, are stuff that actually make us feel concentrated and hooked and be prepared like something important is about to happen. So physically, this is what it gives us. Um, if you think about our phones, and the sounds and the sound of notifications and uh, all this kind of stuff that happened, the colors, uh, I, all of that, it's kind of the same. I mean, we can think about it. Now the leather or the, uh, how the, the leather or actually the button that, uh, that makes the, um, the game um, uh, start is a very short mechanical act that we do. So we feel kind of that we have some kind of a control over this action, right? Uh, but it's so short and the game itself is so short that we feel like we control it, but we actually don't stop and we continue and continue and continue. Um, it's a, a, an action that we do, but it's so small that it doesn't require a lot of effort, and so we don't think about it so much, we don't process it, and so we don't put a lot of attention while doing it. And this is something like when we swipe a lot of time in our app, or when we scroll, when we have this infinite scroll that we don't stop, it's like something, a mechanical thing, we don't think about it a lot, but we just do it and do it and do it. Another thing, the last thing is the, and maybe the most important one is the variable reward. What does it mean? It means that there's going to be a game, and we don't actually know what's going to be the end result. Are we going to win? Are we not going to win? Are we going to lose? Like, what's what's going to happen? So it's kind of the same thing as when we're waiting for someone to text us back, right? We see that they're typing, so we're, we're prepared, and we think, okay, what is it going to be? Is it going to be a good message? Is it going to be a nice one? Is it going to be an annoying one? What's going to happen? And when we scroll the feed of uh, news apps or like social apps, when we have posts or tweets or whatever, we don't know what's going to be the next one. Is it going to be good? Is it going to be interesting? Is it going to be boring? Like, what's going to happen? And physically, in our brain, this anticipation caused a chemical called dopamine to release in our brain. And this dopamine is in charge of our uh, pleasure uh, centers in the brain. So it's, it's very chemical. It's very, you know, it, it's, this is how we as human work. So it releases in our brain. And this is actually what makes us feel this pleasure. So the anticipation makes us feel uh, the pleasure. And it has been shown that when, this when we anticipate to stuff, even with addicts, um, when you're addicted to, I don't know, drugs or food or, or stuff like that, the anticipation of it makes the dopamine levels go higher. And it doesn't change when you actually consume the thing that you are anticipating to. So the anticipation and the variable reward that we are not sure what's going to happen and what's going to be the, the result of what we're doing, this actually uh, what makes us feel this pleasure physically. Um, now, many people say that they feel addicted to their phone, that they cannot stop uh, using it. There is actually a medical clinical term for um, phone addiction or phobia. It is called nomophobia, so it's no mobile phobia. Many people feel a certain, yeah, and it's a clinical term, and many people do feel, and you can see it in the chemical, in the hormones that they have in their body, anxiety, while they don't spend enough time with their phone or when their phone is away for a certain amount of time, if they forgot it somewhere, they feel anxiety. There are tons of studies that show that. Um, not, it's not always uh, fits in the category of actual addiction in the clinical term, but the fact that many people f say that they feel addicted and they cannot control it, and the fact that many people say that they feel that they use the phones too much, 
uh, is already something to kind of worry about and to consider, right? Um, now, actually, since we have these feelings all the time, we got to the spot where sometimes when we don't use our phone, and it's not because we didn't want to, but suddenly the battery died, or suddenly we didn't have reception, or we forgot it somewhere, then sometimes for many people there are these moments of joy. Do you know what I mean? Has it ever happened to you? Yes? Okay, good. So um, there is this moment of joy, and fondly we gave it the name Jomo, joy of pissing out. So we feel like uh, we are disconnected, and we're relieved, and we're happy now, and we don't need the phone, and we're disconnected from the world, and now we have so much time for other things. Now, the thing that we don't, the reason that we don't do that a lot um, is that because as human beings, we need many times the social approval, and sometimes when we don't have it, it makes stuff harder for us to do. So uh, there is a, a very interesting professor uh, called Dan Ariely. Um, I took some courses of him, and one of the uh, things, and he talks a lot about um, behavior, irrational behavior, and the social uh, approval sometimes that we need to do things, uh, that motivates us to do things. One of the um, uh, things I remember him uh, telling us is about when and how did brushing our teeth became something that we know that we must do every day and that we do it every day and that basically toothpaste um, uh, sales went up. So they tried many things to explain to us as people to explain to us that it's important and it's, it costs us a lot of money if we don't brush our teeth every day and that it's healthy for us and so on. But the thing that actually clicked was when there was a commercial, a very heavy campaign that uh, put mint taste on the toothpaste and then marketed it as something that you must have you must have this minty breath in order for the other people next to you to feel comfortable sitting next to you. So it's something that the other person must have. And you don't want to be this person that does not have the minty breath, right? And this actually what made the cells go up and what made us all brush our teeth twice a day. Um, yeah, basically. Um, so this is kind of interesting. and. Sorry, I read it. So, and this is kind of interesting. And since we don't have that many times with, uh, with phones and with communication, and we feel, and everyone feel that we all need to be connected all the time because everyone are connected all the time. So we have this kind of a social loop. Um, it's very hard for us to do, right? Now, I want to share with you something that, um, you know, for me, it's, uh, it's normal, but I've learned that not many people know. As I told you, I'm from Israel. Um, I would not say that I'm a very religious, I would not label myself as a very religious person. But we have a, a very, one of the most sacred, sacred and holy day for us. Do you know how it's called? Sabbath. Maybe? Sabbath, and like, yes, yeah, Sabbath is like our uh, Saturday, sort of, and there's like a holiday called Yom Kippur. Maybe you've heard about it. It's one day a year, uh, 25 hours, a day of uh, basically reflection. So you have to like uh, reflect, to look uh, um, with on, on, on all the things that you've done uh, this year and to understand if you've done something uh, bad and... Um, to do something about it, basically. So in order to help us do this self-reflection and inner um, look and inner conversation, the, the habits are to eliminate many, many um, other external um, habits and stuff that we do. So people don't eat and don't drink. Many people don't use electricity at all. Many people don't use any type of communication. And these are the things that basically everyone can do, you know, with themselves in their own homes uh, by themselves. You don't really know if the other person does it or not, right? Because it's everyone uh, in their own home. But if you are in Israel at that time of the year, 
at that day, a very magical thing happens. And that is that the country actually shuts down. And the shops are closed, there are no services, there are like nothing in the streets. And the most apparent thing is that there are no cars in the streets, like at all. Now this is a photo that I've taken from, this is uh, my, uh, the view from my terrace in my house, uh, in my home. This huge road is uh, Ayalon, is uh, the, the highway in Tel Aviv. And this is how it looks once a year, every year. And it's kind of magical, like this silence and this thing that everything stops for one day. And the fact that everyone does it and everyone can see that everyone else do it, right? Because no one would go on the street because no one else goes on the street. So this kind of social loop uh, makes us all uh, go into the Jomo zone for 25 uh, hours a day, even if you're not very religious for social reasons, uh, you would normally do it. Um, and it's kind of magical, to be honest. So the thing is that for us, it's a little bit uh, difficult, right? Because we don't have this every day. And since technology kind of created this problem in many senses, technology can and should help resolve it, right? It just makes sense. Um, and yeah, this is our responsibility and our privilege actually to help and reshape it and, and do that. So uh, one of the interesting things, if you've seen the, uh, the Google I.O. keynote, many of the things that have been discussed there uh, were about uh, digital well-being. And these are the things that we now talk about and our responsibility as developers as well. And if we look at the things that Android P um, has in store for us, so many of them are about that, about the digital well-being. So we have this dashboard. Now the users have the dashboard where they can see all the, uh, the apps that they're using, how much time do they spend on each app, how many uh, unlocks did they have, how many notifications. All this stuff are now um, going to the awareness of the users, uh, which is very powerful. Also, it's a lot easier now with many, many features for the users to make a shush to silence and to ask the phone and the apps to not disturb them right now. So uh, if you've heard, if you flip the phone, uh, it would go into the do not disturb mode. And also you can set up pair app. How much time did you want to uh, spend with it? The assistant can uh, go to the, can help you go to the do not disturb mode. And all these new things are here to help us to um, to make some quiet time and disconnection time for ourselves. Also, you can set the times where the uh, device or the screen would go grayscale. And as we said before, the colors make us feel that something is happening and we have to be more alert. So this would help us with that, just make everything grayscale, you know, before we go to sleep to, uh, to calm our mind down. Um, and this kind of stuff that are on the operating system that would help basically our users more than us to, uh, to disconnect and to go to the good place, to the Jomo, to the good place that we want to be in. Now, but what does it mean for, our, for us developers? Mostly, I think it means that we have to be a lot more responsible. We have to be a lot more responsible in the time and the um, attention that we grab from our users. Because now the users are aware, uh, they are smarter now, they are more aware, so we have to uh, cooperate with that. So what does it mean? For example, if we can, we should try always to interrupt less, right? The users are going to know now how many notifications got from each app, uh, and we should try to minimize, uh, to minimize that as much as we possible. So as we said, as a user, you have a lot more control and a lot more awareness about who grabs your, uh, your time and attention. Uh, and you can disable the sounds a lot. It's a lot easier than it used to be before. As developers, as I said, we should try to minimize that. And it, there are many studies that show that even if you show like one um, 
um, notification a day with everything in it. And now we have many styles in our notifications. There are many styles that allows you to have the, um, the, all the information in a nice way and a, and a readable way and approachable way for the users. Um, so maybe try that. Um, to minimize the, the amount of, of times that you interrupt and grab the, where, the intention from your users. Another thing is basically to try to have the more important, I mean, the users do want to get the notification, they do want you to interrupt them, but only when it's very important. So try to understand what are the most important things. When would the user want you to be uh, interrupting them? Uh, I can tell you a quick tip that the, the study shows that the most important thing for the users is basically uh, who sends the information. So who's trying to reach them and not so much the content itself. So if you can identify who uh, sends this message, this data, this information to the users, uh, it might do uh, very good uh, decisions uh, to, when you decide if you want to interrupt or not. So if you already interrupted, make it count. There are many ways if you already had this in the, um, the uh, interruption, the notification, there are many ways now to make it count. If you use, uh, um, uh, sorry, if you use uh, input, you can reply straight from the notification. You can use actions. You can show all the information to the users, photos and everything that you need already there without having the user needing to open the app and spend a lot more time uh, on this data. Now, another thing is please try to be productive. So if you can save time for the users while onboarding or while um, uh, doing some performance uh, uh, modification on your app, the users are going to be happy, right? Because now they are aware that they spend a lot of time. You don't want to be the app that spends so much time of the user. Right, so you want to try to save the user time on things that they don't need to spend time on. And also, if you can do some magic things to them, for them, um, try to do that as well. So Google Photos does uh, a great uh, job in that, for example, when you take pictures, photos, it would suggest to you, hey, this filter might look good, uh, this is uh, a collage that might be nice, and this is an animation. So it does this magic for you. Um, in order to save time in processing and in using your app itself. So this kind of stuff are actually a lot easier now because machine learning and all these smart functionalities are now we are now able to get them in our mobile apps with MLKit, with TensorFlow Lite. It's a lot easier to do smart things for your users. So try to think about that, what the users spent a lot of time in your app, and how can you make it more productive and more efficient for them. Um, one last thing is basically to add friction. So we said before that many times users just scroll, right? And we said why, but users just scroll. Uh, we have the infinite scroll. They don't think, they just do things. They swipe, they, we give them the automatic uh, play, right? The autoplay in like in YouTube and stuff like that. Uh, and it makes them spend a lot, a lot of time. So uh, one nice study showed that um, when they wanted to make some, um, um, okay, so it was in some uh, tech companies, and they wanted to encourage the, uh, the workers, the employees, to eat better. So to not take so many candies and stuff like that. Uh, and it didn't matter for them if they charged them a little bit more for the, uh, for the candies. And if they put it here or they put the bowl there, it didn't really matter. The thing that mattered for, um, for them the most is that they added this small friction. They just added a cover on the jar. So the employees needed to put the cover off and then take the candy and then put it down again. And this small friction, actually what made them a little bit more aware to what they're doing, it's like, a friction of a second, right, to make this decision. Um, but this made a lot of a difference, and this was the best way for, uh, for the employees to eat less candies. And the same way here, if you can add this friction of the automatic um, actions that the user do, you should try to do them. 
Um, stopping queues is something that uh, you actually make the user stop for, for a second and think about what they're doing. We can do it, I will not talk about it so much, but for example, switching maybe infinite scrolls with Paging, where the user needs to click and to decide to load the next information, could be a good solution. Maybe some alert to, to ask them, hey, do you really want to play the next video or not? So this kind of trick, uh, tricks are something that can help the user uh, think for a second, do I really want to spend the time here or not? All right. Um, I'm going to skip a little bit because we're short of time. But what I do want to suggest for you, sorry, I do want to suggest for you at this conference today is, at least for the talks that you find interesting uh, and that you love, ask for yourself, how does that, the new thing that I just learned or the new thing that I just thought about, how does that make the communication for me better? And when I say communication, as we talked before at the beginning of this talk, I'm talking about communication in the broader sense of it. So what does it mean? It can mean the communication between the user and the service, so what your company is trying to accomplish. So it can be smart things that we can do. Maybe you learn about some new libraries or some uh, ML capabilities and things like that that would make the user's end goal uh, easier to reach. It can be the communication between the user and the app. As we said, we communicate and we make them feel uh, things, so all the things that had to do with um, animations and, uh, and uh, performance and all this stuff would make this interface and the communication with the app uh, more fun and better for the users. And the communication, of course, can be something that is within our team. So all the things that has to do with architecture and uh, better coding and stuff like that, uh, or processes are stuff that make the communication better within our team. And I believe that better communication within our team would actually go uh, and make a better communication you know, through the product and get to our users. So in order to just wrap up, uh, this space between the FOMO and the JOMO, so the space where the users really like your app and really like the value that you give them, and do not want to miss out on them. And the space uh, between that and the, and the place where they feel like they control the situation and they control the user, the, the usage. Um, and they do have this sense of control on what's happening and they feel uh, that they can disconnect whenever they want. This is the place and this is the sweet spot that you want to be in and that you want to find. Um, so I really want to thank you so much for listening and for uh, being with me. And I wish you to have all an awesome conference. See you around.